Hello, Brav. We're back with the grandmother's stories. We go to a long ship ride. A long ship ride. Early in the fall of 1822, Father and Eber and I sailed away from Conneaut in the Salem packet for Yankee Point. Sally and Abba stood upon the dock and waved us goodbye and tried not to cry. But I could see through the tears that were rolling down my own face that they were crying. Eber rubbed his eyes with his fist as boys will when they want to cry and are determined not to. End in consequence looked red about the eyes and nose and white in the rest of his face. When we could see them no longer, I went down into the cabin where father and Eber couldn't see me and wept the bitter tears of a mother parted from her children. No one would believe that a girl of my age could have the feelings I had for those children. I didn't see how they could get along without me, and I knew I was very unhappy without them. After the first paroxysm of grief was over, and I thought that I still had Eber and father to love and care for, I wiped away my tears, washed my face, and went up on deck to see what they were doing. Father was sitting on deck reading a favorite book, and Eber was talking with the sailors, asking them all sorts of questions about the sails, the management of the ropes, and everything he could think of in regard to the ship. Before we got to Yankee Point, he could steer the boat pretty well, knew all the nautical terms could help furl and reef and set the sails, and made himself useful and agreeable to everyone on board. The sailors in those days were not the low, swearing fellows that too many of them are now. But they were the sons of the neighbors, helping a neighbor sail his ship. Often they became ship owners themselves after a time. Of course, Eber taught me everything he had learned, and we enjoyed this first ride in a big ship immediately. We little thought that 30 years later he and Uncle Sam would be the owners of the finest fleet of steamers that ever sailed the Great Lakes. But so it was. Here, Golden Hair looked at Eber and Porty as much as to say, I wonder if you will ever be capable like that. Yes, said little Emily, but I thought Uncle Eber had big iron mills. That was still later, said Grandma. He established the first rolling mills in the Northwest and the first Bessemer steel manufactory in America. Sailed the first steamboat on Lake Superior, which he took overland three or four miles across the Sioux Falls Carry before the great ship canal was dug and did a great many important first things in both commerce and manufactures, as well as being the first businessman in the Northwest, which was Michigan, at the time for many years of his life. But just at this time, his mind wasn't particularly burdened about being first in anything, except making the most of his surroundings. He was always merry and lighthearted, full of kindly ways, obedient, industrious, truthful, loving, and without a single mean trait. I don't say this because he was my brother, said Grandma with some emphasis, and with eyes that might have flashed if anybody contradicted her, but I say it because it is true. As the mamas and aunties of, and the children all knew that Grandma told the truth from their own knowledge of Uncle Eber in late life, later life there was nothing said, and as only a look of intense belief was seen in all the eyes turned towards Grandma, she continued, when we got to Cleveland, we went ashore and walked about while the vessel was putting off and taking on freight. At that time, it was a little village you could walk all over in an hour. It had about a thousand inhabitants, and no one thought of it its ever being a big city. We also stopped at a place that is now called Toledo. Then it consisted of two little frontier towns, one on each side of the Maumee River. People who came down to the wharf looked lean and pale and yellow, as if they hadn't much left to live for. The pioneers of Michigan and Ohio suffered a great deal from fever and ague. I remembered father asked one of those one of these sickly looking beings if the town wasn't a pretty unhealthy place, and how surprised I was to hear him say with some indignation, "It is the healthiest place in the United States." Fever and ague used to shake and burn these early settlers until they looked like ghosts. But it did not abate the pride they had in their new homes, and nothing made their eyes flash so quick as to suggest that the particular place where they lived was not as healthy as it might be. Lake Erie had been a little rough at times, and I was not sorry to get into the placid waters of the Detroit River. 
Eber and I were never tired of looking at the rippling water as the vessel glided through it, nor at the beautiful shores covered by primeval forests that had not yet bowed before the frontiersman's axe. Everywhere silence reigned, the beautiful silence of nature. Not yet subdued under the weary yoke man puts upon her, we stopped at Detroit, a little town of 1,500 people, and walked about with Father, who told the stories of its struggles for existence and the fights for its possession between the Indians and French and English and Americans. Now it lay placid and peaceful, not in the least realizing the misery it had passed through, nor the career of prosperity that lay before it. When we got to the St. Clair Flats, we lay there, becalmed for two days, for there was neither a tug nor a steam vessel of any kind on the Great Lakes. Father and Eber and the sailors went duck hunting, for then, as now, the duck knew about the St. Clair Flats, and we had a great feast as the result of their spoils. When we got fairly out on the St. Clair River, our delight was increased by two things. First, that we were near our destination, and second, that it was the wild, the widest, cleanest, deepest, and most beautiful river that ever anybody saw. There certainly is not so lovely a river in the world as the St. Clair, not the storied Rhine, nor the winding Oklawaha, nor the palisaded Hudson can compare with it, in my estimation. I don't think in all its, all this long journey we met more than three boats as large as ours, and the smaller craft were few and far between. Occasionally, we would see an Indian in his birch bark canoe placidly fishing. Arrived at Yankee Point, the boat stopped at Little Wharf, and there the whole population was assembled to meet her. All the news from the outside world came through her, and all the luxuries of life they had were brought in her hold. So it was not to be wondered at that every man, woman, and child in the place hailed her arrival with joy. We lived in this place five years, about which I will tell you more hereafter. Goodbye.